Hey guys, welcome back to Wounded for War. Uh, today we are jumping back into the book of Acts. Uh, it's going to be in chapter 2, and we're taking it from the beginning, verse 1 through 13. Uh, three things I want to show you right up front that we're going to take a look at is uh, an open mind, an open heart, and it leads to an open door. We're going to see that in this section as we take a look at uh, essentially the mission of of the Holy Spirit, uh, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see open minds, open hearts, and open doors. So let's jump right in with the first one, open mind. So we start at verse one where it says, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, I want to stop right there, uh, Pentecost, just so that you get some context for this. Uh, Pentecost, we know today uh, as like, it's really the Pentecostal movement has made the biggest impact uh, on that word and how we use it. Uh, but at the back in this day, they were not um, of that mindset. They were uh, aware that this was a Jewish festival um, that was primarily around Thanksgiving of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. That's what this is. It's about harvest. So during this time, uh, when the day of, of har- the celebration of harvest had arrived, they were all together in one place. And we know uh, from the previous chapter that uh, when they all got together, the 120 uh, were, were up in an upper room and they were praying, right? So they're all together in one place. And suddenly, in that moment, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house they were staying at. Now, it wasn't um, a violent rushing wind, but it was a sound like it. This describes um, the Hebrew word ruah. Ruah is, um, it means divine power. Uh, This was um, probably a scary moment, if you think about it. Uh, you're sitting there, you're waiting for Jesus. He's told you that he's going to come in power, uh, empower you. And, and yet uh, what happens is this violent rushing wind sound comes into this place that you're at. So it's probably scary, um, but it's also going to draw the attention of people as we will see. So uh, during that um, moment, where they had that happen. It says in verse three, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. So now we have this scary sound that is drawing the attention of a lot of people, we'll see, and 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 scary, I'm sure, to the believers that were there. And, and on top of that, now we have flames of fire uh, that are, are coming about and, um, and resting on them. Now, Just to give you some context of, I'm, I'm sure that if you're in that place, you're probably freaking out, right? Uh, or, or, or maybe the Holy Spirit gave them an, a supernatural peace. In my mind, I would be sitting there um, definitely tripping out on the whole thing. But don't forget that they had a history of what the fire meant uh, to them. In Exodus 13:21. It said that the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud and led them on their way during the day and in a pillar of fire to give them light at night so that they could travel day or night. You see, this was God's present uh, presence that was with each of them. Early in their history uh, of Judaism, they were led by that as a nation. This fire and this cloud would lead them as a nation. But in this case, now we see that it's separating out to each individual. So they understand, um, I'm sure at that moment, that um, God's with them um, by that, especially seeing how it's not consuming them. It's not lighting their their you know garb on fire it's not lighting their hair on fire this is just a fire that's resting on them uh, representing the presence of god maybe you remember the story of moses uh, when he comes up to the the burning bush there was a fire that wasn't able to even consume the burning bush it just kept lit 
And so, uh, but that represented the presence of God as well. So they had a pretty good working knowledge of what fire meant to them. Nonetheless, it's still different than what they had experienced in the past. It goes on in uh, verse four, and it says, Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And now, uh, if you weren't uncomfortable up till now, it, you probably are, right? At this point. They were speaking in different tongues. Now, I know there's been a lot of abuses of it. Maybe you've um, been to a church where uh, if everyone's speaking in tongues and, and maybe you don't, so it makes you feel like an outsider or, or distant. Um, and, and maybe you just, you think, well, maybe they have something I don't, right? But note that in this moment, um, in this case, God chose to use this gift in particular to reach people, um, that the Galileans wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. That was his goal. It wasn't to give them some uh, special power uh, to make them look cool. It wasn't some special power that um, that somehow uh, you know was was uh, an attraction uh, so that they could get uh, notoriety. This was just something he used to communicate. Um, to a people that wouldn't be able to be communicated. And by the way, it's not gibberish that he's talking about here. This is talking about specific languages we will see in just a moment. So don't be afraid if God answers your prayers uh, by shaking things up a bit. In their life, that's what happened. They were seeking God, they were praying, we know from the earlier chapter, and the reality is, is as he answered their prayers, he shook things up. A little bit more than a bit. He often works outside of our comfort zones. He wants us to trust that he's able to do great and mighty things again. If you're praying for revival like me, don't expect business as usual. You don't expect business as usual. That will only get you what has already been and, and is going on now. But if you're asking for God to move in a radical way in your community, he may end up um, shaking things up a bit. Now, the good thing about that, though, is that it leads to open hearts. In verse 5, we start there and it says, Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, before I go on, this area where it says uh, devout men. I want to be clear about something. These were the hyper-religious. These aren't just your everyday average, um, you know, Jewish uh, individuals. These, they would all, as a Jewish culture, go to temple. They would all go to uh, prayer uh, three times a day. But the reality is, is that these were these types that were um, rigid in their belief. Maybe you've met a few people like that. They're very um, unlikely to change direction in their life. Why? Because they've invested their whole life into this direction, right? So they're the least likely to change. And, and yet, in verse 6, it says, When the sound occurred, a crowd came together, and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So these devout people, these religious people, came flooding as they heard this sound. The crowd came together. Notice, notice this, that, that there wasn't any um, work of men or women that were done at this point. They were passive. They were... They were Passive in the way of they were praying, but they weren't mustering up some strategy or or marketing plan or or you know some program that's devised by man's ways. The Holy Spirit knew how to draw people without their help. 
I find that interesting because we spend most of our time in the church today devising strategies, plans, and programs, thinking that it will um, somehow draw people in. That's not God's way, as we can see. He's capable of drawing people all by himself. It goes on and it says that uh, they were astounded and amazed that uh, saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Something to know about that is um, this astounded and amazed translates very, very uh, strategically. It's actually to remove from a place or to alter. So here, the Lord knows how to alter or move someone from one place to another, an ideology from one place or to another. That's why I say we don't need to devise marketing strategies. You know, in, in James 4, 15, it says, instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So it's, it's God that we go to for the plans. I'm not saying that strategies or, um, or formulas or, or marketing are bad. I'm not saying that they're bad. But what I am saying is we ought to submit everything to God and say, it's yours. If you want to take it and run with it, awesome. If you want to throw it in the garbage, awesome. We often in church get so stuck on our traditions. We start with our plans, our marketing and our strategies, and we put together programs and then God forbid any of them go away because then people are, are you know, uh, upset. And so we stay with those and they become monuments, essentially. The word, these words astounded um, and amazed reflects the fact that the Holy Spirit was doing a work inside their heart, literally that he was altering what was there. He was literally removing it from its place of, of stuckness and, and moving it to a new place. And notice that uh, God had used a certain people, right? Who was that? He used Galileans. Why is that important? It's very important because they were the lower class. They were um, a people group of shepherds and uh, farm laborers. Uh, they were the poor of the, uh, the people. What does that mean to us today? Now, I'm, I'm looking at the city of Lake Stevens and, and assessing, Lord, what are you doing? Because you're, you're wanting us to plant a church there. What are you doing? Well, this makes me look at the 5.7% of the people that are living in poverty in Lake Stevens and, and say, God, you can use them to save the whole city. Notice as we go on, it says, um, how is it that each of us can hear them in our own native languages. So like I said, this, this was a language. These, um, when they started speaking in tongues, it was um, an actual language. Parthian, Medes, Elamites, those who were uh, in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phagria, um, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, and near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own languages. So, he's using the, the low class individuals in a town and he's using them to declare the magnificent acts of God. These are these hardcore religious people coming in, listening to the low class that wouldn't be educated. And they're, they're actually speaking in a foreign language of their own that they can hear them in. And they're, they're speaking these 
testimony, so to speak, um, of God's faithfulness and goodness. I got a question for you. Do you have any testimonies? Do you have any magnificent acts of God that you can speak of in your own life? It, it draws people's attention. It helps them to listen and hear, wow, could this God be real? I know for my own, I'll share a story. Um, I was um, struggling in, uh, in my life. I had been um, on the lowest of lows and some of the highest of highs uh, and, and yet um, completely unsatisfied and scarred by some of the past um, things that both had been done to me and the things that I had done. And so what happened was one day uh, I just, I got so frustrated that I, I put my fists up in the air at God with one, one finger on, up at him and uh, to be transparent and it's not your number one i mean it wasn't cool and so in that moment though um i want to share that i was doing thirty six hundred dollars per month worth of drugs i was a sponsored skateboarder as well as uh, i was killing it in the the business world and making a six-figure income and thought that that would I had my dreams, I, I beat the odds, I only had an 8th grade education and I thought for sure that this would make me happy, but I wasn't. And so uh, I had tried so hard to be a good person and that's why I had my fists up at God. I literally said, God, I've been trying so hard to be who you want me to be, a good person. and." And, and I, I'm not, leave me alone. And literally that's when I heard a soft, still voice in my heart. And uh, he said, that's what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for you to know that you can't do it. And now I'm gonna show you my strength in your weakness. It was in that moment that um, I didn't feel the earthquake or, or you know, a wind, uh, so to speak, Ruach come through. But what I, what I did have happen was just as spectacular. It was definitely a miraculous, magnificent act of God. He took away my desire for um, all the drugs, $3,600 a month for it. Um, I was like smoking about a half, a, a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. He took that desire away. And on the weekends, I was uh, between uh, the weekends and over a month, I was spending about $1,000 in alcohol, um, just partying. And God took all three of those things out of my life, took the desire right out of my heart. My, at the time, uh, my girlfriend was just baffled. She didn't understand. She's like, are you okay? Uh, was offering for me to come in and, and smoke with her and do, you know, and I, I was just like, no, I'm good. And that's a testimony that I have that I can share with people and, and bring about um, what I believe is this next step. And that's an open door. Um, they were astounded. No doubt. It says in uh, verse 12, the, again, the second time that they were astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. How many of you know that when you are transparent and you let God work through you, you're going to have both um, fruit that comes about from it, people that are curious about God, and then those that are just haters and and completely want to discredit everything the holy spirit was on mission though and he opened a door what does this mean and we're going to see next week um, how to address that peter's going to do a great job of it
empowered by the Holy Spirit. But I want to leave you with this. Number one, Jesus followers having, having an open mind to God's work in a new way led them in, that, in a way that wasn't like their past, by the way, but he, it worked. And this meant that they had to be uncomfortable with the unknown, which essentially is faith, right? It's faith. To step out into new things, it, it's hard. It's not easy, but um, it bears fruit. The other thing I would say is the Holy Spirit opened hearts of religious people. People set in their ways by empowering people who we would look down upon today. Weak vessels, but empowered vessels. So my prayer for, for you today, that God would stir in your heart a new openness to what he might use you for and that you start to see his empowerment to do what he's called you to do. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that you do. We thank you and praise you that you use the weak, the broken, the weary, that Lord, you can empower us in a way that reflects uh, who you are, your nature. We can tell of your magnificent works, Lord. And Lord, all the while you, you could create open doors. You don't need us as we saw, but you want to use, with, use us and partner with us. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray for those that are watching this, Lord, that they would be empowered by your Holy Spirit to walk into new things that you're calling them into. That, Lord, you would do a mighty work in them so that you could do a mighty work through them. I praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.